קצת. If you don't understand English, please raise your hand. Good. If you don't understand my English, please raise your hand. Okay, so the reason I speak in, uh, in English because uh, there's a video recording and they want to publish it uh, later on the web. Uh, my name is Itai, uh, and uh, the talk is called Monitoring Patterns for Mitigating Technical Risks. Uh, so what I will do, I will go over a few well-known monitoring patterns. Uh, later on I will uh, show some of the implementations using uh, Riemann which is a dedicated monitoring tool in an open source one. And the reason uh, I'm thinking about monitoring this is because if you don't have any business risk, so you know why monitor? If, if, if your customers don't care if you have downtime, then don't monitor it. Okay? Uh, that's not the case. But the way we approach monitoring is by first asking the business, okay, so what's your greatest fear, technical fear? Uh, uh, and then uh, we think about our uh, uh, about our risks. So the first risk uh, we have, I think anyone with a public API has, uh, but especially in the e-commerce business, uh, is that uh, your REST API won't be available, or in our case, we would return uh, the result too late, uh, too slowly, or God forbid, we expose some kind of uh, 500 or 503 error message which basically tells our customer look you need to take a decision take it on your own and that's th this is like a big no-no when you talk with e-commerce merchants okay they want a decision they want you to know what you do with their transaction they're in the middle of a workflow uh, and when someone clicked that I want to buy something and they need to uh, you know deliver the goods and send a receipt and you can't uh, you know stop it in the middle so this is our uh, biggest uh, risk, and there are two ways to approach it. The first one is to fix things automatically, okay? Because we as humans are too slow. It takes at least, you know, uh, let's say 10 minutes, 15 minutes for another to propagate, and then to, to, to understand what the problem was takes even more time. And so you need uh, the system to react uh, by itself. So this is, uh, we'll go over a few basic of the meeting patterns. And then for the rest of this talk, we'll talk about uh, how, how to do alerting, okay? Uh, so the first thing before you start monitoring is to understand what type of system you're monitoring. Okay, we will focus about uh, what Grant talked about, the low latency system. But uh, if you think about if uh, let's take probes, okay, so you send a request and you expect a response. If your system is a best effort system, then you don't always get the same response, but you do that. Okay, so the monitoring system has uh, to be built uh, and fit to the use case that we are building. So basically we have, as Van said, we have a low latency system that basically uh, must not drop any transaction, but uh, can do the business logic, you know, uh, the best it can given the time constraints. And then you have an events reprocessing system that is more high throughput, and has less uh, data, uh, data loss constraints. And then later on, we, it, 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 I mean, sometimes before the transaction and sometimes mostly after the transaction, uh, we need to run reconciliation system, for example, to send uh, the bill to our customers, right? And you do not want any mistakes. It's not a best effort system. You don't send the bill to your customer and say, you need to pay us between one and $10. It doesn't work. Uh, so, I'm going to focus on this system implicitly uh, because uh, this is like this is the most uh, interesting part of low latency systems. So automatic failover, I just go through that uh, uh, because you know this is like the most basic part. You have an exception. You usually let it bubble up, and if it's uh, unless you know what to do with it, you need to let the process crash. Okay, it's called fail fast. And then you have uh, a system uh, daemon like Upstart or System D or the new one, uh, what's the name, System 18 or something like that, uh, that restarts that process. And this is the basic level. On top of it, uh, the complete EC2 instance, the virtual machine, can uh, terminate at any moment. Then you need uh, what Amazon calls a scanning loop uh, to pick it up and start uh, a new uh, virtual machine instead. On top of that, you have the load balancer that needs to decide uh, where to route the transaction. 
And if for any reason it doesn't get a response from one of the instances, one of the processes inside the instances, it just routes it to another instance. And on top of that, you can use uh, either a third party provider or even uh, uh, DNS can provide parts of this uh, uh, fencing, which basically means if this data center is off, just route all the traffic to the failover data center. Okay, so this is like this is the last resort. Okay. So this is automatic failover. Uh, once you have customers, you usually have one or all of those. Uh, the second pattern is graceful degradation, uh, and that's very important because uh, the code that changes the most uh, is what the Ram showed earlier, and that's the the, the the Java part. Okay, and if the Java part, if the storm does not respond in time then you need to send something back to your customer, okay? So, you have uh, the API server, okay? Uh, that is written in Node.js, and it needs to do something. It needs to take some kind of decision. And this code is more stable because we made less code changes in it. And then, if Node.js uh, uh, has any problems at all, uh, we have Nginx in front of it, and we pro uh, program it with the Lua programming language, and uh, it needs to take some kind of decision, because as I've said, we need to provide our, our customers with a decision. Uh, uh, Folder is a decision as a service uh, kind of startup. Okay. Uh, the last uh, pattern that I want to, to mention that is uh, you know, part of the auto he automatic healing uh, patterns is, is how to do throttling without uh, applying back pressure on your clients. So let's say uh, one of our clients had some kind of a problem and they want to resend the entire last day to us in one batch. And we don't uh, want it to interfere with the real-time system, okay? Because we did some kind of capacity planning and such and such. So, but on the other hand, we, we do not want to, to send back an error, okay? Like uh, most services do, does, like uh, you know, PagerDuty. Uh, so we don't want to send back an error, listen, you, you exceeded your limit. So we don't want to apply back pressure. So what we do, we have a small code in the Node.js that does like local monitoring per customer. And if the transaction per second is bigger than the threshold, it sends the transaction to a different, uh, it defines it as a different priority, sends the transaction to a different queue, and this is picked up by a different worker. Okay, it's a different machine, different process, so uh, the real-time uh, workers are entirely not affected. Uh, on top of that, there are test probes. Uh, test probes we do send to each of the queues because we want the test probes to cover everything. But inside the queue, we use a priority queue, so the test probes are, are uh, they have a lower priority. Okay. Uh, so if the queue is stuck, the test probes are, are stuck too, and then we get an indication. So this is for uh, so these are all the auto healing patterns and. Everything that is covered by auto healing should not be covered by manually by a human being. Okay? Everything that is not covered by the automatic system needs human intervention. And for that, you need some kind of alert. Okay? So the most basic monitoring system is detect that there is some kind of problem, try to do some filtering because we humans cannot absorb so, so much uh, events and data and phone calls. And, and then you produce some kind of alert based on uh, you know uh, some kind of uh, a timetable. So today uh, I am uh, on schedule at well, Oren uh, is with the page duty schedule. And, uh, and once you get this phone call or this alert, you need to do something. You need to look at some kind of dashboard and, uh, dashboard and perform uh, manual diagnostics. So this is our uh, simple monitoring system. Uh, this is the detection points part, okay? So we have Pingdom. Uh, Pingdom just sends a simple HTTP request. Uh, we have our own system tests that are uh, basically uh, Node.js test file that send our uh, REST API request and then check the result, check the, uh, if the state has changed in the system. And then we have all our uh, code that is based on Node, Java, and Python, and send, it sends uh, a lot of events, uh, some of it latency recording, some of it are exceptions and irregularities. And for the infrastructure, we have our uh, inside operating system collect dRunning, which is one of the most, uh, you know, one of the oldest ways or most stable ways or common ways to monitor our uh, uh, Linux systems. 
and we have uh, AWS Amazon Cloud Watch that monitor, uh, monitors the infrastructure that Amazon provides. Uh, the next stage is to filter all this data, okay, and, uh, and for the rest of this talk I'm going to uh, focus mostly on Riemann. Uh, and then uh, Riemann does two things, it can do event stream processing, or basically some kind of filtering, and it has all kinds of output plugins, so it can route uh, uh, this event, or now this alert, to the right uh, uh, to the right uh, alerting system. So if this is, uh, you know, just a, um, if this is the first time I just vote uh, an alert, I don't want it to wake to wake it, uh, to wake me up at night. Okay. So what I do, I usually route it to Slack, and then I wake up in the morning and I get this like a chat report of what happened. Uh, or uh, if this is uh, you know production uh, alert, I can route it to PagerDuty with uh, varying urgency uh, settings. They they recently introduced uh, uh, urgency uh, settings, and from there. Uh, PageDuty knows what you do. It, uh, it knows uh, which one of the developers is on call, uh, what is uh, their preferred, uh, you know, notification method, and uh, and basically it notifies us that we need to do uh, so this is the other thing, and we need to do some kind of diagnostics. So any information that goes through Riemann also goes to our dashboard. Okay, uh, the open source stack we use is uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the driver is Logstash and the UI is uh, Kibana, uh, which is uh, one of the most, Kibana 3 is one of the most customizable uh, dashboards there are. Uh, we haven't upgraded to version 4 yet. Uh, we are waiting it for be, to be, you know, feature complete with the version 3. Uh, but basically, any developer can uh, add to an existing dashboard or write new dashboards and we have, uh, I think, more than 20 dashboards right now. Uh, so the first thing that you saw about the detection phase that we have a lot, uh, uh, a lot of redundancy, okay? And that's good because monitoring systems are not as highly available uh, as the rest of your system because you don't have enough time to make them highly available. So you need multiple monitoring systems in case your own monitoring system uh, fails. Uh, so the infrastructure alerts, uh, basically we have CloudWatch and CollectD, and they give uh, very fast alerts. Usually when we have a CPU spike, uh, it's a real problem. And, but the problem is that they don't give any root cause. I mean, it's, it's pure detection. Uh, then you have all the exceptions and events from the application, and they tell you the story, they give you the root cause, but they're usually, unless it's, you know, it's a fatal exception that we had to press the process, they're usually too noisy for generating alerts. And then you have the pingdom probes that if you get one of those alerts, you know you're in trouble because all pingdom does, it checks that your HTTPS service is online. That's it. And they do it great. Uh, they're very reliable. But the problem is that it doesn't cover all of our customers' use cases. Okay, Each of our probes, uh, you can call them system tests, uh, cover the entire spectrum of our customers. Okay. So we have our, our own general probe system. It has better coverage, but as I've said, uh, since our system is uh, you know best effort system, it is very difficult to get it right uh, to make the uh, uh, to reduce the false alarms uh, level. And each time we get a new customer with a new use case, we need to reiterate on these alerts. Uh, so this is how uh, this is the old page of the uh, mobile application. This is. This is how it looks when, uh, for example, Amazon produces an alert. This is an alert from the Elastic Load, load Balancer that it saw one of the uh, systems producing an error. And you can see that the filtering is done by Amazon. Okay? It comes, it said, okay, I waited uh, for uh, you know, five data points and I saw it, uh, you know, the threshold is one in this case. Uh, but it's all, you know, five instances of, uh, of this problem. And this is how it looks uh, when a system probe fails. Uh, we have a system probe that alerted Rima, which, as we will uh, see in a minute, alerted PagerDuty. And then after some time, the test pass, passes, and then Rima closes uh, the alert in PagerDuty automatically. OK, and you can see here the history. Uh, they recently introduced a new, more slicker UI where you can type 
you know, swipe left and right. And this, left, this is this was uh, the left uh, the left version. Uh, so, how do you filter the system tests uh, using a state machine uh, using Riemann uh, before you alert PagerDuty? We don't want every system test to be sent to PagerDuty. Okay. First, because they would throttle us, and second, because uh, there is no reason to do it. Uh, so, uh, we built uh, uh, a very processing uh, system that is based on uh, Riemann. Uh, which I will show you, uh, you know, uh, the implementation in a minute. But the logic goes like uh, goes like this: Look at the event. If the event has some kind of tag, for example, this this is the name of the test or the test suite, and uh, uh, each each of those event has the state of the test. If the test recently failed or passed, and there was some kind of uh, state change, okay. Then do one of these. If the state is okay, the test passes, then tell PageDuty to, to resolve the alert. If there was a state, a state change, but the test failed, then trigger PageDuty the alert. And this is this is what you would see in the Riemann documentation. Uh, this is how it looks in the code. Uh, uh, the reason of, of all these braces is because uh, closure is basically Riemann is basically based on closure. And closure is basically based on uh, uh, list, uh, and so I will translate uh, what you see. Okay, so all of these functions are streams. It means that you will never see or almost never see the event itself. You don't have x like you have in another uh, other programming languages. You just talk about uh, functions, about transformations of data. Okay, so. If the event, yeah, there's no event here. If the event is tagged like this, then call and then move the event into this string. This this is a function that can get an event. Okay, and this is the definition of the function. Okay, uh, if the state changed, and assuming the state machine starts with this uh, state, then check if the recent state is passed. Then Resolve the pager duty alert, and if the recent state is failed, then trigger new pager duty alert. This is exactly the same uh, logic that you saw earlier with uh, with the flow diagram. Uh, we will do more and more code snippet and less and less flow diagrams uh, as we get used to it. So the problem with this simplistic alert uh, uh, approach is that if I wake up and I resolve the alert on pager duty, and then go back to sleep. Now what happens? Riemann, the state, still thinks that it alerted PagerDuty, but the problem keeps persisting. And I would like it to uh, Riemann to reopen the PagerDuty alert. Okay? So, uh, for example, uh, there was a test that failed. Uh, Riemann still thinks that the latest state is uh, that the test has failed, so there is no reason to alert PagerDuty again. On the other hand, uh, I manually resolve using the PagerDuty manual uh, application, a mobile application, I manually resolve the, the alert. And then uh, what happens is that the alert does not reopen again once the test fails again. So this is how we solve it. Uh, this part is the same, okay? Only resolve if there was some kind of state change uh, and, the, and the new state is that the test passed. However, if the test failed, regardless of any previous state, then we will talk about this concept. We will basically uh, uh, perform the entire, uh, the rest of the stream uh, uh, by doing like, it's like a group by in SQL. Okay, you split the stream <coughs> by the name of the host of the service. This is like the, the machine under the test, and this is the name of the test. And then send it to pager duty. But make sure that you don't send per test, don't send more than one uh, trigger per minute. Okay? So all this complex uh, logic is implemented uh, in Riemann uh, pretty easily. Okay? So this is the code that you saw earlier. Now this where clause or if clause is outside the change state. And I can do this uh, by uh, split screen and then throttle one per minute per test 
and only then trigger pay to view. Okay. Is throttle a Riemann construct? Yeah, yeah. It's it's basically another function that gets an event which we don't see here, and it outputs the event only if it happened one if, uh, it happened more than one per minute. Uh, so closure uh, is a little bit uh, difficult to start with, and Riemann even more so. But once you're in it, you get uh, a lot of power and less full sound. Uh, and now, once you get the alarm, you need some diagnostics tools. You need some visualization. Uh, this is uh, this is not the real stone topology. This is just a mock. But you can see that uh, a lot of information, like the latency, okay, or the time uh, since we first uh, saw this transaction, we sit on each one of the of the bots in Storm. We can uh, use it to diagnose exactly where the problem was. Uh, we have a different view. Okay, which is more like a timeline. So here are the names of the bolts, or are out of the screen, and, and these are the latency metrics, start and stop, and this also allows us to understand that we had some kind of uh, problem. Okay, and which bolt uh, uh, is the root cause of the problem? How can you tell which one is taking too long? Is it a different color? Uh, usually. Uh, most of those are pretty short, and you see them, you know, in succession, pretty, pretty fast. And here, I, I think it's, it's down here, you have some kind of lag that shouldn't be here, okay? Or maybe it's down, maybe it's down just some kind of, uh, I don't know, JVM garbage collection or whatever. And you can see that you have a few bolts that, you know, took forever. So basically, here is the problem. Uh, the more uh, low-level uh, uh, this is Kibana, okay? Uh, we can see here some of our latency metrics. We see here uh, uh, the, you know, the median latency, 75 percentile, and we see also the 99th percentile. Um, and we can filter by uh, name of the, the branch name, okay? If it's production or develop, or what version of production. Or, or any developer can start a new branch and then uh, filter all this data, you know, based on the, the branch name. And, and down below we have the list of raw events, you know, that is basically an elastic search. Uh, yeah, small question. Uh, first of all, are, is the data coming to Rayman or uh, it's being pulled by Rayman from so all the places? So Rayman is, uh, is a push-based monitoring system. Um, the way it works that you either have an open TCP connection, which is the preferred way, and then you also get a uh, pushback, which uh, could be a little bit danger dangerous if the client is not implemented correctly, or you can send via UDP, which is uh, less recommended, but uh, it's, it's more safe from the client side, but it doesn't, you know, uh, you're never sure if, you, if, if, if there's a real problem or it's just a network issue. Yeah, especially yeah. Yeah. And low latency, it's not yeah. really yeah, so this is just the monitoring system. I mean, uh, yeah. it, I mean it could react slow, slower yeah. than the than the red system. <coughs> uh, do you, is it yours, your metrics or the stone metrics? No, no, everything uh, is uh, like we, we don't use all uh, the the Nimbus internal okay. storm monitoring tool. We, we don't use. It. We built our own system based on Riemann and uh, Elasticsearch. Yeah. How testing development branches is actually cool. Can you repeat the uh, I was just asking how you said that each developer can open its own branch and uh, get metrics yeah. for it. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll what's just the repeat. Infrastructure behind it? Yeah. So I'll repeat the question. The question was how come uh, how does each developer start a new branch and, and test his code and, and get this dashboard? So basically, we have a script that uh, checks what branch are you on currently and then deploys code with the exact same branch that you have on your laptop. It even checks if you forgot to do commit and push and all that kind of stuff. And when it reports to Riemann, automatically we add this, uh, you know, this information. What is the name of the branch? Uh, when was the, the, the branch deployed? And then also kind of some metadata about the branch. And then we filter it uh, uh, either in Riemann or in Oxfam, uh, or in uh, sorry, Kibana. So uh, the second risk uh, that uh, the business defined 
is that our JavaScript snippet that our customers have uh, would hurt the performance of our merchants. Because the, the worst thing that could happen is that someone wants to buy something and it fails. And the second thing that, it, that uh, the second worst thing that can happen is that, is that someone tries to browse the, the web page and, and it's, it's, it's too slow. So we want to be able to know that our customer has a problem even before he knows it. Okay, it's very important because once you get the phone call from the customer, it's the entire you know technical support and uh, customer success and all the managers. I mean, you don't want that. You want to be there first. You want to know that there is a problem. So uh, here, what we define is that we want to monitor each and every browser. Anyone that browses our customer's website, we want to know about it and we want to know what's going on there. Uh, and then we want to do some kind of aggregations, but we also that because usually in the JavaScript uh, problems are uh, common to specific types of browsers and incompatibilities, JavaScript incompatibility between, between browsers. And then on top, on top of that, we, we can define alerts. Usually we send them to Slack. Uh, so what do we monitor? We want to know about timeouts. Uh, if someone downloaded the script but didn't actually get to run the script, the page didn't load. Uh, we want to know about errors uh, and we want to know if it's specific to one JavaScript, uh, you know, snippet version, only the new version, or, uh, or this is some kind of uh, merchant problem because no matter what version, JavaScript version, snippet we use, the problem uh, exists. So, we need to deep dive deeper uh, uh, into Riemann and the Riemann internals to understand how to do it. Because this is, I think, that we are the first that use Riemann instead of server monitoring. We do browser monitoring, and it's not, you know, it wasn't built for that from day one, but but it works. So when you monitor a server using Riemann, Riemann holds an index. The index is a copy of the last event. Okay. The last event for each server, for each process running on that server, for each service. Okay, so if you have an Nginx on server number one, or Redis on server number, uh, let's say, 10001, and this and, and this specific event counts how much you know three megabytes or gigabyte Redis has. Uh, so the event says the metric is five, let's say five gigabytes, and the host name is its IP address, and the service is whatever. Uh, whatever uh, metric that you want to monitor, and what, and here we see uh, this is just an example uh, for one uh, that we sent to two different machines, and here the test failed, and here the test passed. passed. Okay. And what uh, Riemann does, it stores the latest event that matches this key. Okay, so if this test runs again, and the event state changes to passed, it will only store the last event. Okay. And it's, it's like a basic hash map. What it also does, and this is the nice part, it updates the time to live. Okay? When the TTL expires, the countdown clock expires, Riemann sends a fake event, which is almost the same as the event that it has uh, you know, it's stored. It just changes the state to expire. Okay? And we're going to use that. Okay? We are going to use that to understand if uh, someone just downloaded our JavaScript snippet or also loaded it. So the first thing we do, instead of thinking of it as a host and a service, we think of it as the browser IP address and the cookie number. Okay, these two identifiers are unique uh, to the browser uh, and the browsing experience. And our event state could be loaded, uh, which means the page is loaded or downloaded, which means that they only reach for a JavaScript snippet, but the page hasn't uh, been loaded yet. Okay? And it gets much more uh, complex than that, but we leave it as you know a very simple state machine. So we have three states, uh, JavaScript downloaded, uh, page loaded, and then expired, which basically means some kind of time on hand. Um, so I promised you that I would explain how why works, and once you understand that, you would understand the tricks that we had to do to uh, adapt Riemann to this new use case. So, uh, we talked about the index, it stores the last event and creates 
private events. Uh, the byte class basically uh, receives the stream, okay, which usually, as you saw before, wears something, throttles something, and each time it sees a different combination of class and service, it would create a new stream. Think of it like uh, JVM objects, okay? Create new objects and. If it is an existing hosted, ser uh, hosted service and this object has already been created, it just uh, passes the events to, the, uh, to that object. So for example, if I have uh, 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 a certain uh, browser and a certain cookie, if this is the first time that uh, I saw this kind of event, then it will dynamically create all this thing. This thing. If, it, if this is the second time that I saw uh, this event, it will use the existing string objects and just uh, pass these events into the existing string, which lets us uh, actually maintain state. Okay. Uh, what we did, uh, we forked a uh, Riemann and we we added a new con concept that is called by host service, which is almost equal. I mean, it is almost the same as this one, except it does garbage collection. There are much more browsers in the world than enterprise or data center servers. Okay? And so the default implementation never cleans garbage collection. And to do it generically, in the main branch would be uh, would require some kind of rewrite. So what we did, we did we took only our use case, which is pretty simple because the index sends us an expired event. And once we see that event, and when it is streamed to the existing object. Okay, uh, an existing string object, it automatically deletes that object and then it is garbage collected uh, through the JVM garbage collection, which allows us to monitor uh, more and more browsers without you know, reaching uh, any memory limit, without having you know, garbage collection problems or memory leaks. So, I promised you some more Riemann code. Uh, so, this is the state machine that we're, I mean, it's much more complex than that, but this is like a simplification. You have an event that says that the JavaScript has been downloaded, and then you get an event that the page is loaded. Sometimes you don't get an event, and then the Riemann index sends an expired event. Okay? And this is the logic that is based on that state machine. So <clears throat> this defines the stream, and the first thing we do, we create, you know, think of this like it's uh, a lot of objects, okay? Each time we have a new a new browser or a new cookie, we create, I mean, Riemann creates a new object, okay? And then once it does that, uh, we, we check if the state has changed. Was there a state transition? Usually there was, okay? Usually you don't download the script more than once. Uh, and then it transfers both the previous state and the current state to this function. This is why this is like a hint that tells Riemann that we want both the previous state and the new state. And this says a simple if, it, it's just an enclosure. Okay, so I'll, I'll read it as if it was in a simple language. If the previous state equals downloaded and the current state equals loaded, then uh, change the metric of the previous event to be the difference between uh, the current time and the previous time. Okay, all, all we do is take this downloaded event and change the metric to include the time it took to load the page. That this is all you know, this is what this section does. And then if the previous state equals downloaded but the current state equals expired, then uh, pass on the previous event, but this time change the metric to the time of value in many seconds. So this is one stream. Uh, the next stream after it does the aggregation. So this is, uh, this is for example, a pie chart showing uh, the certain time range, uh, which browser had, uh, which browsers had time lines, okay? Uh, so uh, how do we do that? Now we want to split the stream. Okay, the same stream we had before, but this time group by browser. 
to have this phase. And then we want uh, to have a list that includes all the events from the past 60 seconds. Okay? So this is what a fixed time window does. And then we want to do two things. SDO says, like, split the stream again. Do two things. The first one, find the median, chetion, okay? And add a tag to the event and pass it on to whatever child stream there is. Usually that is Elasticsearch, okay? And in addition, count the number of events in the time window, add the tag, or whatever, and then pass it on to Logstash, Elasticsearch, Kibana. And then you can use Kibana to draw this kind of uh, charts and of course time-based me uh, based metrics and we can add alerts based on that because the same data we see in uh, Riemann, we also, uh, in uh, Elasticsearch in Kibana, we also can use Riemann to produce alerts. Okay, the last risk we're going to talk about is I mean, when I first came to photo, I thought this is like this is the number one risk that we make a mistake. Uh, apparently, this is only the number of you know this is like the third technical risk. And alerting on such a system that is a best effort system, which is uh, so complex as uh, I have showed you, uh, is very difficult. And what we need to do, we need to have variable thresholds. Okay, so monitoring based on variable thresholds is called anomaly detection. Uh, so, some requirements. For example, I want a different threshold per customer. Okay, some customers have high decline rate and some don't. And I want to take into account seasonality. Okay, uh, and, 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 and sometimes, for example, Christmas, uh, the decline rate changes. Okay, compared to, let's say, I don't know, whatever, uh, June or July. And I want to define uh, I want you to be able to define uh, what is the sensitivity level of the alarm, okay? So, this is the, you know, this is the architecture. Basically, we have a process that reads from Elasticsearch, historical data, and alerts Riemann. Usually, it also does all the filtering, and it uses Riemann just, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a router, you know, to decide if it's it. If it's you know if you need to send it to PageDuty or, or a Slack, uh, because the thing is for for real time monitoring you don't need a disk based system. This is all only in memory, and as long as you have enough memory and CPU, this system is very very robust. Okay, here you have this you can get out of disk space, uh, you know, IOPS uh, limits and stuff like that. So we need historical data only for anomaly detection. This is why. You see this line only, only, only. Um, so this is the mathematical definition. Alert me if the probability that we decline too much is one in a million. Okay, we'll go into the, the K and N in a minute. If something happened that the probability that this thing would happen is one in a million, then please wake me up. Okay, this is the definition that. I, I want, I want to say, I don't know what the threshold is because it keeps changing, but this is what I want. So, uh, what we use uh, is we assume that um, uh, the dis distribution of uh, the client is uh, what is called binomial distribution. So, we have n transactions, k of them were declined, okay, and the probability. Of a decline in speed. Okay, so let's say I take uh, I use an elastic search to perform a search query. So I perform two queries. The first one is 24 hours back, or so, or two days, to calculate what is the per customer uh, probability uh, for it for transaction to be declined. Okay, it's, it's it's pretty simple. We ask, give me the number of transactions in the past 24 hours. Give me the number of declined transactions, and then uh, I think we have page of UK, just on that. Five down. Yeah, real time. Yeah, page of duty. <laughs> you want to hear it? Yeah, so, don't get the care. Can you check it? Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so, basically, 
uh, back to the, the math. I, uh, here we can perform two elastic of queries. Give me the number of transactions in the past 24 hours. Give me the number of uh, declined transactions. Divide those. And this is our uh, <coughs> probability for a declined transaction. Then, give me the number of transactions in the past 30 minutes. Give me the number of failed declined transactions, sorry, in the past 30 minutes. And then put that into some kind of binomial distribution. And this is the Excel chart that help us understand how it works. Uh, here you can see the nice binomial distribution. Okay. So basically what we define here is, you know, alert me if something happens, this is one in a million. Uh, assuming in the past 24 hours we had, you know, let's say 100,000 transactions, uh, out of which, uh, let's say 5,000 was declined. So this gave us P of 5%. And then in the past 30 minutes, we had 300 transactions, okay? Then, if zero of, the, of those are declined, then please alert me, because this is, I mean, for, for out of 300 transactions, and with a 5% uh, probability, for no uh, transaction to be declined, uh, decline, it's usually uh, in this, in this you know, threshold is a problem. Or, given 300 transactions, if more than 36 uh, were declined, then other, okay? So, I don't have to define these numbers, 36 and zero. I don't have to do that. I just need to define, uh, make sure that this incident is so rare, once in a million, okay? Uh, then wake me up. And the way this is translated is as follows. This is the binomial distribution. So. This is the probability for seven declined transactions per 300. This is the probability for six, for five, for four, okay? And the probability for seven or less, okay, is the sum of all those. So you need to do an integral, okay, sum, the probability, and then compare the threshold to the number that you see here. And in order to, to have this threshold, you need to do one minus the sum of probabilities and then compare the threshold to the number. Uh, it looks complicated, but basically it's, 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 a, it's a simple Excel file. Uh, and it allows us also to change the probability uh, function and still use you know, uh, the same semantics of wake me up if this is a one in a million. There is only one problem, and this is the last slide. The problem is that a binomial distribution assumes the, the events are uncoded. And what would you do if you log into a website and someone declined your transaction? You trade again and again and again and again. And these events are correlated, okay? Because there's some kind of human there that does this correlation. So what we have to do, we need to ignore, I mean, we usually look only at the first transaction and we ignore the rest of the transactions for this system and then we get back something that is more of an uh, uncorrelated uh, distribution. Uh, that's it. Uh, you're more, most welcome to visit our uh, tech blog and you saw the software architecture edit video. And of course, we're hiring. Uh, these are my uh, contact details if you want to ask questions. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, question?